things in life because if I come to you and I come to speak to you, you know it's me talking to you. You can sense what I want by my body language or whether we've had previous conversation. However, knowing when God is engaging you is a little more tricky because I don't know anyone that said, you know, you stood right in front of them like I would stand in front of you. But rest assured that God does engage us. Now, the, the thing about it when God engages us that gets us sometimes is that when we engage God, we normally go to God with what we want from God. Can we agree on that? We oftentimes say, God, do this. God, can you give for that? God, can you provide for this? Meaning we want God to work inside of the circumstance that we have. The problem with that is most of the time when God engages us, he doesn't leave us where he found us. Which means when we engage him and say, fix this, God says, go there. He takes us to a place that isn't quite as comfortable because it causes us to have to stretch from where we've been sitting. In Genesis chapter 12, we come across a man named Abram. I say Abram, and I'm not making a mistake for those of you who say, no, his name is Abraham. When we arrive in chapter 12, his name is actually Abram. His name does not get changed until chapter 17. God changes his name because Abram means high father, but when God promises to make him a father of multitudes, that's when he changes his name because that's what the name now signifies. But when we arrive in chapter 12, we see God engaging Abram in a way that he had not previously. You see, the great thing about this passage before I get into it is that God is engaging someone who does not yet know him. You see, if I backed up into chapter 11, you'll see the sequence of how we even come to know Abraham or Abram exists. In chapter 11, we see a family unit, a man named Terah, T-E-R-A-H, take his children, Abram, his brothers, and his grandson Lot, as well as Abram's wife Sarah, or Sarai at this point, and they move out of their homeland of Ur of the Chaldeans, and they go down headed to Canaan. En route, they stop in a place called Haran, and the Bible says that they settled there, but their initial goal was Canaan. Did everybody know that? Now, the irony of that is Canaan is the land that God will send Abram to. But en route, sometimes we settled in places we were never meant to stay permanently. And this is what the family does, and it's there that Abram's father dies at the end of chapter 11, and in chapter 12, God steps back onto, on the scene to engage Abram, this morning what I want to impart on your hearts is that when God engages you, he does not leave you where he found you. When God engages you, he does not leave you where he found you. That sometimes means location. It oftentimes means perspective. It definitely means a heart change. But he never finds you in a location engage you there for you to stay exactly as you were. Genesis chapter 12, just going to hit the first four verses this morning. And it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, and as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. I want to stop right there. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. You see, when God engages Abram here, there are a number of things he has in mind. And I want to make clear, I'm going to do a dual thing this morning because I want to talk to you about what he's saying to Abram because he's clearly talking to Abram. But there are some principles here that, that should help us when God engages us as we see it displayed in this encounter. The first thing that we should be able to pick up from this encounter is that when God engages you, God gives direction. 
When he engages you, he gives direction. In verse 1, what the, what the verse here says is that now the Lord said to Abram, and the first word he uses there is an action word. It says go. But he doesn't just say, you know, get up and go do whatever you want to do. He says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land I will show you. Now, how many of you know God said, get up right now and leave everything you know is not quite comfortable? But the reality is that as he engages Abram, that's exactly what he does. He gives him several things. The first thing he says to him is leave your comfort zone. For some of us, the principle here is that for us to do what God has called us to do, it's going to push us out of our comfort zones. It's going to push us out of the networks we know into communities we haven't touched. To engage with people that we don't yet know and may not have ever encountered if we weren't intentional about it. Where am I getting that from? He says, leave your country. Now understand this. Abram is actually from Ur, but they've now settled in a place that was temporary. And God says, leave that place too. Now, I don't know about you, but I went into the military. Some of us here have done the same. So we've been through this a little bit. When you leave, when you first get on the plane, well, actually, let me give you a narrative, a little illustration. The first time I flew on a plane was to go to Lackland Air Force Base. I was a grown adult, and I thought I knew everything. Didn't think I'd be afraid of anything. And I was fine until the plane landed in Texas. And I'm at the airport alone in a place I've never been, and other people come who've also never been there either. They come and they have us sit in this special part of the airport, which is really like isolation. They call it the USO, but it's only fun if you know what's coming next. <laughs> and all of us are sitting there very quiet, not because any instructor has come in yet, but because we're all afraid of the unknown. Finally, these people come and they seem nice enough, except for the uniforms. And they put you on a bus. And they're calm-ish to get us on the bus at the airport. The bus is riding, and every first people get comfortable because we think we're OK, and everyone starts to talk. And then we get to where you can see the base. And all of a sudden, it gets real quiet. Because now we recognize we're now stepping into an area and a season that none of us have ever been in before. Now, we probably, well, not probably, we were absolutely right because those videos of the footprints are absolutely real. And when the bus stopped, everything changed. The nice man in uniform and women in uniform turned into villains. <laughs> but they were, in, they were a part of the process to get us to where we needed to go. I tell you that because it was an uncomfortable transition that was necessary for any of the people who had gone to the airport to become airmen. But we had to step away from our families. For, for some of us, what felt like our countries was really just our city. And from everyone we knew to become what we must be. So here he tells him, he says, leave your country, leave Haran, leave the place that you're comfortable with. Leave the places where you know where the stores are and where the, the fun things are. You're going to go someplace you've never been. And when you do it, you're still not even going to have any kind of comfort in the people around you because you're going to leave them too. The people you've made friends with, you're going to leave them. The people that babysit your kids, you're going to leave them. How many of you parents in the room? You know how hard it is to find somebody you trust with your child? Now, the good thing for Abram, he has no kids at this point, but it also says leave your father's house. And what he's saying is you're going to have to leave behind the things that were already given to you to get what I'm going to give you. And that's one uncomfortable thing for us, but this is what he tells Abram to do. And when he does it, he strips away the things that will make Abram feel comfortable. And what he's saying is you're going to have to trust me to go where I'm taking you. And God engages him in a way that even I'm not all that comfortable with, to be honest. Because after he does this, he says, and go to a land I will show you. Now, let me give you an illustration of why this makes me uncomfortable. When I deal with my kids, and as a father, you know how you got a different perspective. So I think it's fun when I do it to them. I just don't think it's fun when God does it to me. 
So my children, sometimes my wife and I will know where we want to take them, but we don't want the 30 questions about when are we getting there. So we'll tell them, go get your clothes on and get in the car. We're going somewhere. And when we say we're going somewhere, somewhere does not mean we don't know where we're going. It means you'll find out when we get there. Y'all catch that yet? God tells Abram, go to a land I will show you. The reason it's not quite comfortable and yet also quite um, exciting is because he tells you, go where I'm taking you, which means you're walking by faith. But you're not walking alone. You see, if ever there was a time where I would tell my son, go, I'm going to show you something, it also implies I'm going to be present. So when God tells Abram to go to a land I'm going to show you, he's telling Abram that no matter where we land, I'm with you. In this small verse, this is where God tells him this now for us. What does that mean for us? It means that as a church, God has a plan for us. Or let me get more personal. As individuals, God has a plan for each one of us. And in the midst of it, sometimes we're going to have to step into places that are not as comfortable as where we've been. Because for many of us, oh, let me fix that so no one feels like I'm talking about you all. For people like me, we can get to a place in our lives where we were headed in the right direction, but got to a place where we were comfortable and stopped. And we made what was temporary permanent. If I took you back, I think I mentioned it before, their actual destination when they left Ur was Canaan. That's where God's going to take Abram. And he's going to tell them, this land is going to be your land. Not the song we sing to our kids, you know, this land is your land, this land is my land. But in the middle of the transition, they stopped. And I believe for many of us, at some point in our lives, whether it be in ministry or in our personal lives, God had a plan for us when he started us. We started walking and got comfortable. And then God said, I'm going to call you out of your comfortable places so that you can do what I have in store for you. But it's not just that he gives us direction when he engages us. When God engages us, he also lays out his plan for you. You see, God is not a go figure it out kind of God. He's already figured it out. Let me show you what I mean by that coming down into verse 2. It says, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Now, it's funny how that sentence reads. Because in one sentence, God says, I'm going to do for you so that you can do for someone else. If we skip the middle, God says, I'm going to do for someone else through you. Which means if we can't step out and do what God told us to do, we're not just hindering ourselves, but we're hindering what God wants to do through us for someone else. You see, in the first verse, God tells Abram his responsibilities. I need you to go. But when we get down to verse 2, God changes the tenor of the conversation. If you walk in obedience, verse 2 I will is what God says over and over again. One, two, three, four times, well, three times in verse two, he says, I will. He says, I will make a great nation of you. What he's saying is I'm going to expand your territory and I'm going to expand your descendants in a way that you couldn't. He comes behind it and he says, I will bless you and make your name great. I can insert another one there. I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Now, it's important that we grasp why I'm harping on this I will, because some of us like to say I will, and we're talking about ourselves. But in verse 2, God doesn't say so that you will until he becomes you becoming a blessing. He starts from the, from the lane of what he's going to do, which means your expansion is not about you. If God is growing Bethany, it's not about Bethany. It's about what he intends to do through Bethany. When he says that I will bless you, meaning I will extend favor to you, I think we need to unpack that sometimes because when we say blessed a lot of the time, 
What we mean is I will get what I asked for. But the word here, when God says, I will bless, the sense of it is to invoke or enact divine favor. What it means is that God is going to give you something that you yourself can't achieve. Anybody ever got a job that you weren't qualified for? And you knew it when they offered it to you? Like you went to the interview, took the interview, went home, someone asked you about it, and you say, oh, no, 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 I ain't got this one. They gave you a promotion and you were surprised? You didn't apply for something and someone came and found you and said, hey, would you be interested in? That's called favor. And favor is not fair, sorry. So it hits us differently, but when the word here, the actual underlining word here, because we see the word bless or blessing twice in this passage, and they're not the same word. In this first one, it's saying God is going to grant divine favor to Abram in such a way that he will expand his territory and his descendants. Now, this is very important to understand because that favor is also what allows a man who is well beyond years and a woman who is well beyond years to have a child when they shouldn't have been able to. So the very mentioning of making him a great nation when he has no children and is of old age in of itself is divine. It cannot happen under natural circumstances. But he also says, I'll make your name great. And see, name here is not like when I get up or we sign name, as in I'm Nathaniel, what's your name? The term here means your reputation. He says, when I touch you, the reputation that that expands is really your reputation, but it's not. You see, when God is working through you, it shouldn't be your reputation that becomes great. It should be his. Because if God does for me and I point back to him, whose name is really getting the glory? And this is what he tells Abram. He says, I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Now, this second blessing that comes up is a different word. It's a variation of the first, but it means to cause something to bring prosperity and life. So he says, I'm going to give you divine favor so that you can bring life. Now think this through. In Abram's sense, and if I take this from Abram to Jesus, Jesus comes through the line that was started back with Abram. So life for us came because Abram obeyed God. But for us, what does that mean? It means that I'm going to do some things in your life so that you can be a light to the world and take life, meaning take the gospel to those who don't have it. But for that to happen, I need you to be willing to go to where people that don't have the gospel are. One of the issues in many churches today are that we're comfortable preaching and teaching and uh, correcting one another in the sanctuaries or in the buildings of the churches. But we spend very little time evangelizing to people who don't know Jesus. So we tend to grow churches at the expense of other churches, dodging the communities that are lost. But God is saying, no, I want you to touch people that don't know me so that I can be a blessing to them through you. This is absolutely the case when you look at Abram, because Abram is coming into an encounter with with Yahweh, God. And what's happening is he's saying, I am going to make a relationship with you so that through you I can make relationship with everyone else. You see, if God didn't want to do it that way, he could have just had a conversation with every person at the same time because he can do that today. But the reason he's blessing Abraham is because you're going to be my image in the world to those who don't know me. And I see that as the same thing that would happen here at Bethany. If you would follow me, not me, Nate, me, God, I'll take you to places that are uncomfortable so that I can be a comforter to those who don't know me. But then beyond that, number three, so the first one, let me give it to you again. God engages us to give direction. The second one, God engages us to lay out his plan for us. And thirdly, God engages us to express his concern over you. Let me show you this in verse three. The Bible tells us, I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the world 
or the earth shall be blessed. I think it's the New King James Version makes it a little more flowy. It says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And some of us love that. We're like, if they don't like me, God got them. (laughs) But what it really says to me when I read that is that God is so concerned with you that he has become your defense. You see, some of us feel like we have to fight somebody who says something about us. We have to come to our own defense. But he says, I'm going to bless those who bless you. Meaning those who do well by you because contingent, in your obedience, you're doing what I said and I'm giving you divine favor. And because I have a plan for the world through you, I am now blessing those who bless you so that they will do what I need them to do so that you can do what I need you to do. But then those who come against you, I'm going to rise against them. This is the same thing that we see throughout scripture. God protects his own, which means he's concerned about his own. Because how else would God ever be there to bless those who bless you if he wasn't concerned about you? How would he even know that someone else cursed you if he wasn't around and concerned about your circumstances? And what he just told Abram is that where you go, I go. So those who rise against you stand against me. Where you go, I go. So those who bless you, they bless me. But my ending is still the same. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, I'm convinced that when he's talking about this, the families of the earth, all of them never got to know Abram. Any of y'all met him? But Jesus came through that line. And guess what that means? There is a means by which all the families of the earth are being blessed because Jesus came and died. So what God said was clear, and what he said is, I'll defend you to the extent that you'll obey me so that I can get to what was always my goal. That in the same way I have relationship with you, Abram, I can have relationship with everyone that I have created with a purpose. So why why do I bring this message at the beginning of the year? Because I want people in this room to don't make your resolutions based on what you think you're meant to do. Because if God has a plan for you, which I believe he does, you'll mess around and make a resolution and God will make you step away from it and then you'll be mad at yourself. Now don't get me wrong. Yes, God wants us to be healthy, so I'm pretty sure he's not going to tell you not to eat right. So if that was your resolution, don't blame me for trying to quit it. But for some of us, it was, I'm going to get this job. And God says, no, I have a plan this way. And it might not be comfortable right now, but I never said it would be because I called you to be different. I called you out of the things that were comfortable so that I could use you for my glory. Amen? So when God starts engaging you, and there are different ways that happens, I mean, sometimes it just sucks. Sometimes I've asked God for stuff and the answer was no. Remember that series? And God was saying no because he had a different plan. And it was uncomfortable. Sometimes the things that we don't want to happen happen and they steer our ship. Sometimes God sends people to talk to you and you don't want to hear it. But the problem is when five people say the same thing from different places, maybe we want to consider what's being said. I said this to someone before. If five different people say the same thing and they don't know each other and didn't talk about you to each other, it might not be the people that's trying to talk to you. And if that is happening in your life, understand something. God may be trying to shift you. And if you have two options and one of them takes you closer to God and one of them allows you to sit where you've been, I encourage you to consider that maybe God is giving you direction that is going to stretch you in a way that will take you out of comfortable places, that will cause you to realize his plan for you. And at the same time, provide comfort that he's with you the whole way. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you take the time to engage us. I thank you that you've called us to engage others. Lord, I pray now that you would speak to your people. Speak to them in a way that they can see you and understand you and understand where you want each one of us to go individually. 
But Lord, I also ask that you would speak to us individually so that we may walk collectively in the purpose you have for this house. Drive us out of our comfortable places in a way that we may touch those who don't know you. That we might become a blessing to others by doing what you've destined us to do. Let it not become about us and about our own accomplishments, Lord, but stretch us in a way that even when things happen, we can only say it was you. Let us do new things, Lord, things that we didn't think we could accomplish. And let us, as they are accomplished, realize that it was only accomplished because of you. And at the end of it all, Lord, let others come to know you. Let others come to love you and engage you in a way that will allow them, too, to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. With every head bowed, unless you're using... um